Hey there, it's Angela. Did you hear about what I'm doing in October? I'm calling it a month of focusing on fewer things better. If you know that you need to streamline and take some things off your plate this school year, but you don't know where to start, here's some support. I'm starting a pop-up group on Facebook for us to have some conversations based on my newest book, Fewer Things Better, The Courage to Focus on What Matters Most. It's sort of like a book club, except easier. You can read or listen to the book at your own pace and check into the group anytime, as often or as little as you would like throughout the month of October. There's no pressure to read chapter by chapter. And in fact, the discussions will be valuable to you even if you don't read the book at all. I want this to be an easy, no commitment way for you to have community and support in living the Fewer Things Better way this school year. Go to fewerthingsbetter.com to join us. Welcome to episode 175 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm talking with Jennifer Gonzalez of Cult of Pedagogy about some common myths around great teaching, and we're debunking them together. Visit truthforteachers.com to get the transcript, or find our new Truth For Teachers podcast community on Facebook. You can share your thoughts on the show there and reflect with other listeners in our private group. This episode is sponsored by UL Explore Labs. It's a free STEM-focused experience to build scientific knowledge and passion among middle school students. UL Explore Labs makes it simple to implement hands-on investigations in the classroom and is aligned with NGSS. Get your students solving real-world problems by going to ulxplorlabs.org. So you might know Jennifer Gonzalez from her incredible website and podcast called Cult of Pedagogy. Both her site and her podcast are a wealth of information on the topic that she's most passionate about, apart from maybe CrossFit. And that topic is helping teachers develop and implement amazing lessons. Jen draws from her experience as a high school English teacher and professor as she researches best teaching practices, and she shares them in a way that is practical and really easy to implement in the classroom right away. So if you like Truth For Teachers, I think you'll find Cult of Pedagogy is a great complement to it. I help you develop the mindset of a great teacher, and Jen helps you to develop the instructional strategies of a great teacher. You can go to cultofpedagogy.com to get connected with Jen. I consider her to be one of my closest friends. We talk throughout the day on Voxer, and I have been a guest on her podcast three times, but this is the very first time that she has been on Truth For Teachers, and I know you're going to love hearing our conversation. Listen in. We are going to be debunking a lot of popular ideas in education that you and I have discussed at length over the last couple of years. And what we've tried to do here is categorize them and sort of condense them into four main myths. And then um, we'll just sort of talk about our take on them. So let's jump right in with this first myth, which is teaching uh, traditional teaching methods should be replaced with more innovative student-centered approaches. And this is a myth that I see perpetuated at times by folks who I think are rightfully fed up with outdated, boring teaching methods that just aren't meeting kids' needs. But sometimes teachers get the message that everything they've been doing for years is suddenly wrong, Mm. and it all needs to be tossed out. It all needs to be replaced with something more innovative. And it's been my experience that the self-reflection piece is really the key. We wanna examine our teaching practices And through that process, we often realize that many of the tried and true approaches do still hold. So I'm wondering, what are your Mm. thoughts about this myth? Mm -hmm. This, it actually reminds me a lot of my daughter who just uh, finished her freshman year of high school and her favorite class, she describes it as this old school, like this guy just taught English, just really basic. You know, they, they did basic lectures. They had reading, they had a little bit of class discussion and they had tests over stuff. I mean, she, she loved it because she was learning. And I Mm. think that's the piece we forget a lot when we talk about innovation and creativity and, you know, making things relevant is that the, probably the most satisfying experience in a classroom is when a person feels that they are learning something. And so, yes, a lot of our sort of more traditional methods like lectures 
can can be pretty effective um, in terms of of delivering instruction. Now, there's there's a whole big question about you know what should we be teaching students and shouldn't we be having them explore things on their own and all of that stuff is it's valid for discussion, but there's also something to be said for just teaching them some stuff that they can use, making them feel confident that they're growing and 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 just doing it in a way that's that's been effective for for centuries. Um, so, for example, you know, the lecture has gotten such a terrible rap over the years that that I think some teachers feel that they just can't ever ever lecture. Mm-hmm. And I think the pushback on lectures has been the teacher standing in front of the classroom for all 45 minutes, just running through a PowerPoint, and the kids just sitting there with their mouths open and just, you know, sleeping basically through that. That is not effective. But there are so many other ways that you can deliver a lecture in maybe just 10 minutes that that is really powerful and also just really efficient. If we know they need to know X amount of information – we could chase it down over the course of a week of having them explore stuff and hoping they find the stuff that we're <laughs> we're wanting them to learn, or we can just knock it out in ten minutes and then maybe have them do something with that information once we have uh, delivered it to them in in a short, powerful lecture. That's such a good point about the efficiency. You know, some of the things that we have kids do, and I, I'm sure we'll get into this more. Um, you know, really just take up so much class time when it, we're, we're waiting for kids to discover things when really you can just tell them, you know, yeah. <laughs> some, things, some things you can just tell them and then let's go do something about that. You know, let's yes. go do something with that information instead of this long, you know, wandering process. And, you know, I know it, for me as a learner, I actually really like direct instruction. If I go to a conference or something, I mm-hmm. like when the speaker spends the majority of time teaching me. There are some people who do, you know, more things that we are, you know, quote unquote, supposed to do, like do the turn and talk and, you Mm -hmm. know, spend 10 minutes discussing with the person next to you. But you know what? I'm there because I want to learn as much as possible. And if the person who's, you know, who's up there instructing is super knowledgeable and has information that I don't have and that the person next to me doesn't have, Mm -hmm. I'd rather just get it right from them. And then we can go do something with that information afterwards. We can go apply it later on. But sometimes the most efficient way to learn, I think really is just, if you know it, then just teach me that. Make it really interesting, meaningful, relevant, and just say it, right? Mm -hmm. And if that, you know, we, we also give a really bad rap to this idea of the sage on the stage, but the truth is if we have gone to college and studied our subject area, we probably do know some stuff about our subject area that our students don't know. And it sort of reminds me of when I go to the hairdresser and they say, well, what do you want me to do? And I think I say, oh, well, what do you think I should do? Because you're the one who knows about hair. If you do exactly what I tell you to do, my head's going to look stupid. So um, <laughs> so it's it's I think it's an important balance too, because it's not just a matter of being up there and droning on. You know, you can tell stories to illustrate things. I just put out a post like 10 minutes ago about the effective use of slideshows. There are so many terrible, terrible slideshows out there and little tweaks that we can make to just make them more powerful and effective for delivering our message. So, you know, um, it's an art to be able to give a good lecture. And some of the stuff that you're talking about, the turn and talks, those can be used to supplement a lecture really, really well to break it up, to give people a chance to process Um, But yes, I agree with you. There's a time when you just want to sit and get the information. And I think a lot of our students feel that way too. You know, if they're just constantly being put in groups to figure stuff out on their own, I think that can make them feel a little bit unstable. So I think really the point in terms of lectures anyway, is that we don't necessarily need to throw them out. I think they are, they have a place in a a nicely balanced set of of learning uh, or teaching strategies. and then there are some other things too, like the worksheet has gotten a terrible um, reputation. And I certainly contributed to that uh, with a post that I put out about a year ago called Frickin' Packets, which is all about this sort of trend that we have of teachers just making these massive packets of worksheets and just handing them out to students. And that's sort of the way they deliver instruction. Those are terrible. But just because an activity is on a piece of paper and it's called a worksheet doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad. You can use those things for lots of different stuff. They can be used to, to like for a graphic organizer to sort of sort out information that you're learning. They can be used for higher level note taking. They can be used for recording data in a, in an experiment or another hands-on activity. So, um, 
you know, I, I hate the thought of teachers just being like, oh, I never use worksheets for anything and, and sort of patting themselves on the back for that. It really matters what's on that worksheet. They can be very, um, very powerful and very effective if they're used thoughtfully and not just as a way to keep kids busy. You know, you mentioned when we were talking about lectures, you mentioned like there is an art to a good lecture, mm. you know. And so if you are a person who likes to lecture, then figure out how to do it well. Yes. Figure out how to make it really engaging. Learn from the best. You know, watch some TED Talks or something. Exactly. You know, and, and really make it something fascinating to listen to. I mean, there's a reason why, you know, TED's podcast is one of the most popular. People actually enjoy that style quite a bit if it's done well. And I kind of feel like the same thing can be true with worksheets. If you are a teacher who can see the value in worksheets, mm -hmm. has seen them be useful for your students, then really learn the art of what makes, um, you know, what makes a worksheet really meaningful for kids. Right. And and make them good rather than just, you know, passing out whatever, basically. Exactly. And, you know, one of the things that, that I will often ask teachers who are frustrated or, or who say, oh, well, I heard this doesn't work. Really, the question ultimately comes down to, are your students learning? I think two different teachers could approach their instruction in completely different ways. And if they get the same result at the end, which is that students who have learned and can demonstrate that, then both of those methods worked. But if you're just hammering away at something and you're seeing that your kids are just not not learning, then whatever you're doing isn't working. Yes. And one of the other things that I've seen happen with worksheets is in the attempt to get rid of them, now I think in a lot of schools we're moving towards basically a digital worksheet. We're yes. just, you know, and we're just turning into something that kids are doing, you know, on a smart board or on an iPad or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the method of teaching and learning has not really changed. We've just involved technology, which, which really just kind of slows things down in some ways, introduces mm. more potential for problems, more potential for disruptions. And the learning's not any deeper. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just, you know, this whole idea that if we are becoming more high tech, then students are going to learn more. I, I've seen in some cases where the kids are sort of like they're in the matrix. They're just plugged into a device and they're basically still just answering lower level questions and sort of doing test prep basically. Or they're spending tons and tons of time on creative projects where, for example, and, then, and I'm kind of now dating myself, but I'm going back to even when we first started letting kids use like Microsoft Word for stuff, which was great, except for when kids would spend 30 minutes choosing a font. Mm. <laughs> it's just, you mm -hmm. know, this is not why we're doing this. That's a fun little thing that you can do. But if it's going to take so much time, then it might not actually be worth it. So, um, but yeah, the 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 switch over to technology, if they're not doing any deeper thinking with it or if they're not creating something new or if they're not, um, you know, really building their skills in some some way, then, you know, you can just as easily do something with with paper and pencil as you could with, with the technology. So um, it definitely does not automatically improve student engagement or learning. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're saying here with this first myth is that traditional is not uniformly bad and innovative is not uniformly good. That in Absolutely. effective instruction, it's just a lot more complex than that. And um, I think we need to offer some room for nuance and in individual teaching styles. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, returning to some of those basics, the, the basic structure of a lesson plan, there's a lot of good there. Um, there are a lot of brilliant people walking around the world right now who were taught with those methods. That's right. So they should not be tossed out at all. I think there are ways to just sort of update them a little bit, um, but not get rid of them. Yep. So the second myth that we'll cover then is about creative and fun lessons. So I think there there is a, a, a big trend right now in education to make lessons as creative and fun as possible in order to increase engagement. Mm -hmm. And I think you and I both think that that's a myth. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between engagement and fun. It's tricky because I think... When a student is learning and they feel that their their confidence is building, that is a certain type of fun. That's what I was talking about before, about my daughter liking this English class. But it's not the same as, oh, you know, we got to play with Oreos and M&Ms today, or, you know, <laughs> we we sang a bunch of songs and, and, and danced around and, you know, we built stuff with popsicle sticks. And um, 
And when I say all of those things, I'm actually thinking of specific lessons that I've seen that actually were very good, but somebody else could do a lesson that looks – It's I, a lot of times I think about what does your classroom look like when someone's passing by in the hall? Mm. And I think sometimes you can have a classroom that looks super fun and engaging because there's like all this stuff and the kids are really involved and it's hands-on and it's creative – but ultimately, they're not really learning anything at all. Um, and they've spent so much time on this stuff. And and I'm guessing some of your readers have heard this analogy, but I use the term Grecian urn to describe this. And where that came from is one of my student teachers was, was working on a unit plan about ancient Greece. And um, he had to teach students about the culture. And in this five-day lesson plan, three of the days were uh, students making paper mache urns in the style that they made them in ancient Greece. And then they had to decorate them in a, a personal uh, style. And I looked at his standards <laughs> because the students were supposed to be comparing the culture of ancient Greece to our culture now. I think the value of comparing cultures is having a better understanding of your own culture and the decisions that we make as a people. And it's a real, it's a way of really having a, a more mature, rich understanding of what it means to be human and all these really deep things. But he was having them work with paper mache. The problem with something like that is that it keeps kids busy. They're having fun from the outside of the classroom. It looks great. Wow, look how active that classroom is. They're not learning jack squats. <laughs> They're just not <laughs> learning anything. And and I see those kinds of activities um, a lot. And so I just gave them the nickname of that might be a Grecian urn, or it might be a little bit leaning toward the Grecian urn. Sometimes we have activities that are very creative and very time consuming. And if they're really time consuming and students aren't really learning much, then maybe there's a way of scaling back. I think that teacher, for example, could have just given students a worksheet, maybe that had a an outline of a Grecian urn, where maybe the students were given five minutes to color in something personal so that, you know, they would still be basically doing the exact same thing, but it wouldn't take three days. And so I, I think with a lot of things, with technology, with um, a lot of activities, you know, because they take up a lot of space on the the daily lesson plan, sometimes we're drawn to them because, well, sometimes we want things that take a long time. <laughs> we want to fill mm -hmm. up lots That's of true. days. Yeah. But also it's just, you know, and we also fall in love with these activities sometimes that we've been doing for years and years and, and they ultimately don't actually meet our standards or give students anything valuable to learn. Um, so, so yes, when we talk about being creative and being fun, there can be much more lower sort of lower key activities that students will come away from feeling really excited about. Like if you just have a good class discussion about something where you're treating them like they have important thoughts and they've got something important to say, a lot of times students will come away from that like, wow, that I felt like I was in a college class. That was great. Can we do that again? You didn't you didn't pull out any paint or anything for that. <laughs> mm, and it mm -hmm. was still a really, really enriching experience. Um, so sometimes the things that look really creative and fun from the outside aren't necessarily satisfying. And I'm going to use a word that somebody else that I interviewed used, which is educationally nutritious. Hmm. And I think those can be a lot more satisfying mm -hmm. than the stuff that looks fun and creative from a distance. I really like what you said about, um, you know, making kids feel like they're in a college class sometimes. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes some of the most creative, quote, creative lessons that I've seen are around topics that are inherently, could be inherently interesting to kids. You know, things mm -hmm. particularly around history and social studies and current event topics. You know, those can be really sensitive topics that don't necessarily need to be fun. Um, right. And I think also most kids enjoy tackling difficult and serious things. That's mm -hmm. been true in my experience. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I know you taught at the secondary level. I taught pre-K to third. And this was true even with the littlest kids. I mean, my my four-year-olds would just come out of nowhere with these really serious anecdotes that they wanted yeah. to share. Sometimes, you know, very disturbing things. Right, and then everyone right. else chimes in. And the next thing you know, we're talking about some really hard stuff with preschoolers. Mm. 
And every single child is completely engaged, hanging yes. on every word, yep. totally focused for, you know, for really as long as I would let it go on. Mm -hmm. So they do have the attention span and the ability to engage in these kinds of things. And, you know, I think kids have an innate sense for when adults are patronizing them. Yes. <laughs> And for when they're hearing real talk mm -hmm. and kids like adults crave real talk. You know, I, I taught yes. my third graders about really hard topics. I mean, we talked about you know slavery, for example, and I didn't do anything fun to get them to care about it. Mm. I would just say things like, you know, most people don't know this, but, or I'd be like, you know, a lot of adults don't tell kids about this stuff, but I think you can handle it. Oh, and I would boy. approach the topic with, with real, that's the best way to get them in. Oh my right? gosh. Yes. <laughs> They're like, I'm in. Tell me. <laughs> yes. Yes. So when you approach these topics with, with, with gravity and deep interest, it pulls the kids in. They feel like they're learning something very grown up, very important. And they were able to stick with me through a lot of really deep and lengthy discussions because they were emotionally invested in the topic. Yeah. So, you know, I would encourage anyone listening to this to do some real talk with their students and just see how they respond. Uh, often the things that we think are too hard for them and need to be, you know, sort of gamified or mm -hmm. made into something more fun are actually topics that they will be emotionally invested in without any sort of gimmick. Absolutely. Yes. The word gimmick is huge too. Um, and there has been a lot of discussion about that recently, especially when it comes to slavery, the Holocaust, you know, in history classes, um, there have been a lot of teachers who have made that mistake of um, doing sort of simulations or games where, you know, the students take on the role of people in these situations and they can become really harmful and traumatizing to kids. And you know, it's it's understandable the place where they're coming from is trying to develop empathy in kids by putting them in the role of people in these situations. But with subjects like that, it can be just as if more effective to do what you're saying, to just have a conversation about it or to, you know, even read stories or read firsthand accounts and then discuss those. Um, I think kids really crave those kinds of conversations particularly now where conversation is becoming more and more scarce, just actual live, mm. <laughs> live mm -hmm. human interaction about things. And so, um, yeah, we don't necessarily always have to go for the fun option. And especially if the topic is something serious, we should not go for the fun option because students need to understand that some topics are not, are not going to be fun. And, and really on a, on a sort of less serious note, you know, there were times when I would work with my students and we would be getting ready to read something that wasn't really designed for, you know, seventh graders to read something that was a little more challenging. And I would just be upfront with them. I would say, this is going to be harder than the stuff that we read, mm -hmm. but it's, you need some practice at reading stuff that's a little more difficult. And so we're going to, we're going to tackle it together and, you know, we're going to get through this together. So I wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't just be like, oh, you know, why can't you read this? It's, you know, it's, it, that things don't need to be dumbed down just like vocabulary doesn't need to be dumbed down for them. You just teach them the words. So I'm kind of going off topic at this point, but I think it's all sort of part of the same idea that um, maybe we need to give them more credit for being able to handle stuff that is maybe a little bit less, you know, bells and whistles. Yeah. That's a really good point. It, it is sort of patronizing to to make an assumption about kids that if it's not like a video game, that they're not going to be engaged with it. Right. It's just not true. <laughs> no, no, it isn't. It isn't. And, and I think they would tell you that too. But um, sometimes when you, when you move your own self into a new generation, you start looking at the one underneath you saying, oh, look at those kids and how they do that. And people really just don't change that much from from mm. generation to generation. There's some basic things that just really hold over time. And I think that's why it's so important to really get to know the individual students in your classroom mm. and mm -hmm. their personalities. And that, that leads us into our, our third myth to debunk, um, which is that if you want to reach kids of different cultural backgrounds, you should include elements of their culture in your lessons. And I, I think there's a lot of misunderstandings about culturally responsive teaching. And yes. um, let's unpack that a little bit. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think there are a lot of teachers who are well aware. I think what we have in, in this country in particular, but I think in a lot of other countries too, is we have a teaching population that is overwhelmingly white and female. 
Uh, and yet our students are way, way, way more diverse than that. Not only are they, you know, many, many different races, but we've got an increasing number of students that are coming to us from other countries with, with m- really noticeably different cultural backgrounds. And so I think among teachers in general, there's there's been a lot of awareness that has grown about this idea that we need to change the way we're doing things in order to meet the needs of a more diverse population. So that's a good thing. But right. some of the approaches have been a little bit misguided. Um, for example, you know, just adding, you know, um, African decorative border around your bulletin boards is not necessarily going to do much for your students or going through your worksheets and changing the name Joe to Jose. Um, those are, <clears throat> those are, are nice things to do in terms of kids seeing themselves represented in some way. I think it's really important for any teacher that has a classroom library, for example, to really uh, look critically at those books to see if um, you've got a a good amount of titles with characters in it that are, have similar backgrounds to those in your classroom. And there are some people out there doing such good work um, on that, on, on helping people grow really good um, classroom libraries that have a diverse set of voices. That is definitely important work. It's important that the artwork in your classroom, that you, you take a look at, you know, if you've got pictures of, of children and, or students or people in your classroom, do they look like your students? Is there a way to swap out some of that stuff so that you know there's better representation? So that is all important, but that really is just one small thing. That's really not what culturally responsive teaching is all about. Um, right. That's a baseline expectation. That's what we right. were doing. That's what I was taught to do when I was in college in the 90s. It, that's multicultural education. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> we we exactly. got to be way past that at this point. Yes. Yes. Um, and I would have to say probably the person I've learned the most from about true culturally responsive teaching is um, Zaretta Hammond. And you and I have both had her on our podcast. So, um, you know, people can keep learning. And she wrote a book called Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain. Um, And what she does is great because she sort of combines neuroscience um, with this idea of culturally responsive teaching. And, you know, what she's, her main point is that, you know, if our students of color are not learning, then whatever efforts we're making toward culturally responsive teaching, we're not doing it right. Um, And, and she, she talks way more about sort of the actual teaching and instructional strategies that we're using one of the things that she taught me is that kids from a lot of other cultures, especially if they have sort of an oral history background, their brains tend to respond um, more quickly to stories than just flat out information. So if there is a way to to turn some of your instruction into something that's more story-based, they're more likely to remember it. Nice thing about that is that your other students, your sort of mainstream American kids who are not coming from any other culture, they will also respond well to storified um, instruction. She also talks a lot about cooperative learning, uh, where obviously we're talking about high quality cooperative learning, not just kind of throwing stuff out there and having the kids just do whatever they want. But a lot of students come from cultures where it's not quite as competitive and, you know, looking out for number one, exactly yes. as mainstream mm-hmm. American culture is. And so they don't necessarily respond to these competitive measures that we put in so many of our schools. They're maybe more likely to respond to sort of team-based um, learning. And so I'm really only skimming the surface here of some of the stuff that she talks about. And there are, are other people out there too, who are doing really good work with culturally responsive teaching. Um, and then also, of course, you know, building relationships with these students, getting to know them individually, learning what makes them tick, feeling that you see them as individuals, learning how to pronounce their names correctly, so on and so forth. All of that is so much more important than hanging a sombrero in your classroom, for example, um, and just mm-hmm. just decorating your classroom in a way that you feel is going to reach uh, students of different backgrounds. Um, especially with the kind of diversity that we have now. And we've got kids coming from countries that some of us are just hearing about now. And so there's really almost no way to to gather up enough artifacts to make them feel at home. What we really need to do is just get to know them as individuals and teach in ways that are gonna that are gonna help them learn 
and then grow and feel more confident and feel that they belong. Right. It, it is a complex topic. And I, mm. I found that when we have complex problems in education, there tend to be prepackaged solutions available mm. for purchase mm, mm -hmm. um, to solve complex problems. And that's that's one of my, my biggest concerns when I think about designing lessons that are culturally responsive is, um, you know, realizing that it cannot be done through a prepackaged curriculum. It is about the individual human beings in your classroom. Yes. There's not a one size fits all response, you know, like buy this product. Now you're culturally responsive. Right. <laughs> it I think like that. I've seen the same thing with restorative justice that I think there are yes. people that want, they want to see, okay, tell me the two techniques. Okay. We're doing circles. We're doing this. We're doing restorative justice. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> it's going to yeah. take you a couple of years to get there. You need to slow down and learn and, and take this, you know, take this slowly and carefully because it is, it's way more complex, which is great because I don't know. I think, I think a lot of times in education, we're so busy and we're so overloaded that we do look for those quick fixes. And when you're dealing with people, nothing is a quick fix. Nothing is, maybe it will be for a few kids, but then you have right. all your other kids. So if we can just take a breath and, <laughs> and, and learn from each other and, and try, try to, try to just slow down a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it, it, this is one of the few areas that you really can't standardize, you know, and so mm -hmm, I encourage mm -hmm. teachers to, uh, well, I shouldn't say that you can't, I should say that um, it, it's more difficult to standardize and that teachers maybe aren't given something that is standardized, like with um, restorative justice, you know, you're mm. not going to be given a curriculum, a step-by-step -step guide, and here's what to do. It's, it's really a lens through which you approach your teaching. Yes. Same thing with being culturally responsive. Yes. And there, there's some freedom in that. There is some ability to be student-centered and be tuned into your kids' needs, which is what teachers want to do. They don't want to mm -hmm. be told, you know, step-by-step, -step, here's what to do. Like we're robots and the kids are robots. Right. Right. So maybe embracing that instead of trying to make it into a, you know, a yes and a no type of thing or right and wrong. Because even kids within the same culture are not monolithic. Yes. And I think sometimes with trying to make lessons culturally responsive, we end up stereotyping and assuming like, mm. oh, they're Hispanic or they're Latinx, so they must like this music yeah. or they must use this word. And that can completely backfire because it's not going to resonate with all the kids and it's going to feel out of character for you. And that might be the even bigger point that the kids don't need teachers to be just like them. They need their teachers to be authentic and real and respectful of them. So I can come into the classroom with my clothing styles and my choices of slang and my musical preferences and so on. And I don't have to mimic the kids to try to seem cool. If I'm being me, then that realness is going to be more important than relatability. And I think it's always more comfortable to be around someone who is comfortable with themselves, even if they're very different from you, than to be around someone who feels like they need to somehow be like you and they don't have any idea of how to do that. And that's what I think happens a lot of times when we attempt culturally responsive lessons is it's the teacher trying to be like the kids and not really knowing how to do it because the teacher is coming from a different background. So in my experience, it's better to be yourself and show appreciation for kids' home and community cultures, but not necessarily trying to adopt it or incorporate it too much. So it can be more student-led. You don't need to rap. You can let kids come up with their own raps. That can be one of the choices for a student project, you know, for example. Or, you know, you don't need to use their slang. You can let the kids use the slang and you seek to understand it and validate it. So find authentic representations of their culture to include in your curriculum, include in your book choices, as, as we sort of talked about in the beginning part of this myth. So they're seeing their culture. Um, but it's from a fellow member of that culture. It's 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 an authentic voice rather than from you as someone who is an outsider to their culture who's just sort of appropriating it. So I guess what I'm saying is be authentic to you and let the kids be authentic to themselves. Yes, absolutely. And it really can be, you know, as simple as that in terms of not not trying to to go so far out of your comfort zone. All right. So the final myth that we're going to cover is this. Planning great lessons always takes a lot of time and preparation. This is a tough one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. What I'm hearing from lots of teachers is that the amount of planning can decrease as student ownership increases. So it takes a big investment of time up front, particularly the first few times that you do things like project-based learning. But as the school year progresses, the kids can take more ownership, and then the teacher is doing a lot more facilitating rather than instructing. So, for example, 
you might need to create all your rubrics in the beginning of the school year. But Mm. later in the year, after kids have had some practice self-assessing with rubrics, that's something that you can turn over to them and do as a whole class activity. Or if your kids are younger or if they're older, they can do it in groups. They can take Mm -hmm. an old rubric and they can adapt it. They can identify what would a level five project look like or whatever and write the criteria. So some of the things that the teacher would have to ordinarily do on their own outside of class can become part of the instructional activity. Instead of the teacher determining what a good project is and telling the kids, students begin to develop the criteria themselves. So that's, that's one example of how, you know, over time, Um, you know, student ownership can actually make planning great lessons a little bit easier on the teacher as you're giving more ownership over. But I know that this is not an area that you feel is your strength. Um, I'm guessing you could still speak to this, maybe share some examples of what not to do. (laughs) Just, Just the idea of student ownership in general, it's probably the thing that I would do the most differently if I went back into full time teaching would be to do less stuff myself and give them more stuff to do. Um, I just was a control freak really. And I was the one who knew how to do things best. And so, um, I do think that I would be more, um, willing to go through that messy process of showing them how to do things like do really good peer assessment. I think I would have them do it and they wouldn't do a good job. And I would sort of throw my hands up and say, well, I guess instead of being a little bit more patient with that process and realizing it's going to take a few tries before they get really good. And I'm going to have to probably give them a lot of feedback at first, but then the payoff, like you were talking about, is going to come later once they really get the hang of it. And I just was never patient enough to work through that process. Um, And I think there's a lot of value in that, in the kids having more ownership um, over a lot of different things. This idea of um, co-creating criteria for an assignment I pretty much just said how it was going to be. <laughs> so I, I do, and that's not, that's the thing is not only is it more work on me, but it's less thinking for them. You know, they always say that the the hardest worker in the room is the one who's learning. So they, my classrooms were, were more passive than they should have been. Um, so, you I know, feel the same. Yeah, yeah I, I definitely feel the same. And I think that that this has been a more recent shift in education as well, you know, and yeah. understanding that we can turn more of these things over to kids. And it, it's a process for teachers and it's a painful process to learn. It does require giving up control and it also requires um, a pretty steep learning curve and a lot of investment of time. So I'm glad that you're encouraging teachers to to stick with it because, um, you know, what we see in classrooms is that it, it's worth the payoff. Mm-hmm. And the thing is sometimes, you know, if a lesson takes three days at the beginning of the year because it's a lot of feedback and, and redirection and correction and that sort of stuff, I, I think a lot of times we get freaked out because we're getting off of our pacing guide and this is taking too long. But it's one of those things where if you're teaching them a method and a process and a way of thinking – it's going to pay off so beautifully throughout the rest of the year once they really sort of have it have it down. And I guess I'm still thinking about like peer assessment of writing or something like that. It would be a lot of legwork at the beginning, but man, you can just sit back later and and let them really do a lot of of good work. Um, and there there are you know there are other strategies. Just a strategy that a an English teacher in California introduced um, on my site last year that has taken off like gangbusters. Um, she calls it the TQE method. She she teaches, you know, books. Students have writing assignments and that sort of thing. And uh, I'm sorry, not writing assignments, reading assignments. They would go home and read and then they'd come in and she would quiz them on the reading and everybody was sort of droopy. Nobody was enthusiastic about it. And she thought there's got to be a better way for me to teach a book, you know? And so she started assigning the students to come in with a lingering thought. Hmm. Actually, I got to check. I don't remember what the T stands for now. I had it. Um, a, A question and an epiphany. And once they did that, those questions that they brought in would make up the class discussion. So it was the responsibility of the students to actually provide the, um, yeah, the T is thoughts, thoughts, questions, Mm -hmm. and epiphanies. Um, She would, they'd get into groups, they would share what they brought in, and then each group would choose one thought, one question, and one epiphany. They'd throw them up on the board, and then as a class, they would just work their way through that stuff. 
And she said it was the greatest thing because they came in with such good questions. And and that's the thing she said over the year, they got better and better as she sort of taught them like what's a good question and what's kind of a blah question. And um, she said, there's no prep. She said, the only prep I have to do is I've got to read the chapters that we all decided we're going to read. And I come in and enjoy the conversation. And my assessment is basically, you know, they get a participation grade for that that class because this is how she does her speaking and listening um, standards. So if you can find these simpler ways of planning lessons that that do put more responsibility on the students, and then you can just repeat them throughout the year, you, you kind of have it made then. Right. I, I agree that that is the goal, you know, instead of always looking for something brand new to do. I think a lot of times we mm-hmm. get sort of shiny object syndrome. We want to find something new oh, yeah. because we get bored with the lessons. We don't want to do yeah. the same thing over and over again. But there's a lot of other ways to get your creativity fix, you know, and, and mix things up and mm-hmm. keep things fresh and interesting for yourself um, other than just spending hours online looking for something new and different all the time. And if you can have a few tried and true, versatile, open-ended activities, you can use them in lots of different lessons. So you know, you, there may not be, a, you know, thousands of things like the TQE method that are super effective and that um, are minimal prep, but you don't need thousands of activities. That's the thing. No, no, no. T- and teachers that are using something like TQE, they use it all year long and they just switch out the text that they're talking about. That's where the, that's where the, the novelty and the variety comes in is that they're reading different interesting books and they're having conversations about all kinds of different things. It's just that this structure is in place and then they just reuse it. And there are a lot of of different things. One of the things I try to hammer a lot on my site is just kids are just so passive a lot of times in class, just sitting there all day long. There have been studies on this. I mean, how long, especially high school students, just sit and sit and sit and sit. And there are really, really simple ways to just get them up and moving. One of the strategies I share with teachers is called chat stations, where instead of having them answer 10 questions on a worksheet, You could literally take that worksheet and cut it up and put those questions around the room on the wall and have students get into small groups and rotate and discuss the questions and answer them on a sheet of paper, or you can have the answer on a flap underneath it or something so that they're actually moving around and having conversations with each other instead of just sitting there answering it on a sheet of paper. There's also a strategy called right to learn, which is super simple. If you're watching a movie or doing a lecture, you just occasionally stop and have students write a couple of sentences about what did they just learn, then they can share those with each other. And it's just a way of mentally processing um, what's going on. Uh, Another thing I don't understand why more teachers aren't doing are just more... um, I'm saying simulations and I'm not talking about large scale historical simulations, but just really simple things, especially if you're a science teacher and you're trying to explain, or even social studies, you're trying to explain concepts about this thing here did this and then this thing reacted that way, whatever it is, whether it's a scientific concept or a history event or something like that. Why more teachers are not just grabbing kids and having them stand up and you be the sun and you be the moon and you be the earth. (laughs) And like, now let's stand here and I want you to spin and I want you to do like, it's super simple. You don't need any equipment. You don't need any technology, but that simple kinesthetic moment there is going to stick in the minds of the kids who participated and in everybody else's mind too, because they're all going to remember that, you know, Jordan was the sun that day or whatever it Mm -hmm. was, you know, Jordan was the queen that day or whatever, you know, the situation was, can they'll all have a little laugh over it, but they'll, they'll remember it so much better than just sitting there taking that information in. And that's, that's not something that really requires much planning at all. You know, this, this really circles back nicely to a lot of things that we've talked about earlier about how, you Mm -hmm. know, simple is often better. You don't have to do flashy. Mm-hmm. You don't have to do gimmicky. It's about yep. doing things that are meaningful and getting kids actively involved. You know, I, there's lots mm-hmm. of ways to have kids not be passive learners other than, you know, doing these elaborate games and, you know, trying to make things super fun for them. Just getting them involved so they're not just sitting there, I think, is, is a huge goal. Right. 
Yes. And the thing is in classrooms, if there is a if there is a foundation within that room where number one, the kids sort of respect you as a person, they feel that you respect them. There's been some effort to get to know each other. So everybody feels academically safe in the room. You can do stuff like yes. that. You can say, Jordan, get up. You're the queen now because everybody in the room basically trusts each other. Right. <laughs> and they can, you know, you know, and you can have these deep conversations about serious issues because you've built those uh, relationships with each other. Without that piece, a lot of the stuff that we're saying should be easy isn't as easy because the kids don't trust you. Mm-hmm. So that's another thing. But yes, I'd say that as a as sort of an overall thing. Well, hold on. Are we ready for this? <laughs> Yeah, we can. <laughs> are we are we moving to the final question? We can move right to the final question. Tell us what's something you wish every teacher knew about designing effective okay. lessons. <laughs> because this does really wrap up sort of all of this, which is that I think teachers do put a lot of pressure on themselves to come up with this new, different, flashy, innovative thing. And you know, start with with what you're already doing that is working well or what other people do that is working well. And, and and what you said too, it can be something that's very, very simple. And in fact, because teachers are so strapped for time and energy, simple should be the priority, not just the, you know, the consolation prize. Like, oh, today I'll do it simply. The more you can simplify the way you're doing it and the more you can find things that you reuse over and over again, probably the better instruction you're going to end up having. You can go to cultofpedagogy.com to get more teaching ideas from Jen through her blog and podcast. Have a great week. You can do this. And remember, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it.